So, I just want to first uh, really say for, for everyone that uh, wished me a happy birthday on Facebook and in person and in letters, you know, I really felt appreciated and really um, glad that I was born to receive so many gifts. And, you know, one of the, th you know, we took the gift card, the PS4 was sold out until forever, I don't know when. So we bought a dining table that we were looking for for a long time. And, and my wife is completely accurate in saying that I did not help at all. I just don't have that gift. But it, and we're not sexist in our family. We believe that the Holy Spirit gives people for those things. And that's not my gift. My gift is to look pretty. <laughs> yeah. um, so thank you for the person that bought me this tie. You know who you are. Um, thank you very much. And, um, you know, I was really uh, touched by all the letters and all that. And, 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 you know, one of the things that, you know, really struck me as I was uh, thinking about this week was, was a group of uh, the university students in our church got together and bought me a pair of basketball sneakers um, called LeBron James. And, um, and I just want you to know, if you're new to our church and you're watching us in media time to time, um, I just want you to know I am a basketball fanatic. And it's because I'm a fantastic basketball player, or, or used to be, okay? Um, and, you know, I, as I was, you know, checking out the sneakers, you know, I just want you to know my childhood idol is Michael Jordan. Uh, my, my first eldest son's middle name is Jordan, after Michael Jordan, not Jesus. A lot of people think that initial J is because of Jesus, but it's not. And, and I'm a huge basketball fan, and, and I, here, here was I. Uh, I had these, you know, LeBron James sneakers, and I was trying to put them on my feet, but my hands wouldn't go there. It's just like, I felt like I was betraying Michael. You know? And then I look up how much these sneakers are, and these sneakers are like $300. And I was like, I thought you guys were broke. And then on the car they go, we wanted to buy you Jordans, but Michael Jordan sneakers are more expensive than that. I was like, really? This is just wrong, you know? And, and, I, I, and I just went off in ideal land, and I, I started thinking, people are willing to pay this much for sneakers? Because if you really thought about it, $300 based on minimum wage, and I'm talking about minimum wage, the new minimum wage will be, I think, about $12. Um, from 2014 sometime. But even if you got paid $10 an hour and you were a student, after taxes, you're making like eight, right? That's 40 hours of work. That's one week of work to put sneakers on. And Nike used 20 cents to make it. That's injustice, people. <laughs> but I thought, oh, I feel love, so I'll take it. But if you really thought about it for a second, what makes a child or a banker, or an accountant, or a lawyer want those sneakers for $300? Well, we all want to be exceptional, right? You see LeBron James go up there and dunk on people, and sometimes flop. You know, and you go, you know, I, I, I want that. I want that type of excellence in my life. And if you study corporate athletes, because LeBron James is really a corporate athlete, right? He brands his stuff. You know, the Harvard Review did something based on the corporate athlete. How these, you know, kids turn pro and how they're, you know, what Gladwell talks in his book. Let's put that picture up. Um, out, an outlier. He, an outlier, by uh, Gladwell's definition, is someone that does not fit into our understanding of achievement, meaning they're beyond the norm. They're an anomaly. They should not be able to do that based on the stats, but they, they do it. And, and he studies how you do it. And we want to be an outlier because we don't want to be normal. We want to be extraordinary. We want to be whatever sector, whatever interest, whatever you know, field that we want to give our lives to, we want to be an outlier. And so we're passionate about that. And that's why a kid would buy $300 sneakers. Because to emulate that, to develop into the aspiration of becoming that is everything. That's the motivation people have. That's what marketing uses. That's the motivation. Now, if you want to talk about Christian in, in, in applying this outlier principle to Christianity, you have to start with Jesus. Because Jesus was an outlier, but let me just stop you for a moment. You go, of course Jesus was an outlier. There was no one like him because he was not from this world. 
He was God, right? The Bible says that Jesus came in the flesh and dwelt among us, full of, full of grace and truth. But I want you to just let you know that a lot of people miss how Jesus was able, and I talked about this a couple of weeks ago, how Jesus was able to be an outlier spiritually, how he loved people when it wasn't easy, how he resisted temptation, how he lived his life to the fullest, how he added value, how he made a difference, and how ultimately he changed the world. Spiritual outlier. But the assumption is Jesus was that type of outlier because it's something we, none of us can do because it was his divinity that accomplished that achievement in his life. It was the divinity aspect. Let me just tell you, that is heresy. Tell someone, that's heresy. <laughs> Yell it to them, that's heresy. 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 Thank you, that's heresy, yeah. It's Jesus, the Bible says, emptied himself of all divinity. Philippians chapter 2. Something to be grasped, right? If you have power in our hungry, you know, hungering power world, we want to grab power. Jesus emptied his power as God positionally. Now, of course, ontologically and by nature, he did not. But he surrendered his divinity and became fully human, positionally. Meaning everything Jesus accomplished in life, was 100% humanity. And this is why Paul says, trying to define, as Peeb spoke about it last week, the idea of spiritual transformation or the idea of formation in general. This is what Paul says in Galatians 4, 19. Row, perfect today. You're an outlier. <laughs> and Paul says, My dear children, for whom I am, Again, in the pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. Now, the greatest obstacle to a lot of people that believe in Jesus already, that follow Christ and people that are investigating Jesus, is that Jesus d does not seem very relatable because the highlight of the focus of Christianity in churches usually is his death and resurrection. The pain and then the, you know, the resurrection. The descent and the ascent. And we, we don't focus on the life of Jesus, which is the part that's most important. And this is why we're doing this series until Lent called The Life of Jesus. You see, the goal of Christianity is that we all become outliers. And you go, well, I can't be God. No. Jesus, as the Bible says, is the, the new humanity. The gospel is about becoming a new creation. Let me just go into a side trail. You know, Jesus will forever be fully human and fully God. When he became a human, he actually changed himself forever. And that's what the Bible calls the mystery of all times. Jesus became, God became something he never was for the first time and forever. And that's the model of what Jesus is calling, what God is calling us to become, a new humanity the best of humanity, redeem humanity. And that's the focus that we're going to talk about today. And, you know, the question we're going to answer is, you know, how was, why was Jesus an outlier, spiritual outlier? How was he an outlier? What made him an outlier? And it's not because he was actually divine. It's actually he was the best of humanity, the, the best of something we all could be. And I just want to let you know right now, that's what the Bible is telling us. That's what Paul means. Paul's saying, my mission is to help you become like the best of Jesus was. To love when it's inconvenient and actually have joy in loving. To resist temptation when it's easier to fall and falter than uphold conviction and value. And we're going to talk about that. How we can become a spiritual outlier. So let's look at this text. And... Right from the very beginning, if you thought of Jesus' divinity, this text wouldn't make any sense. This text in Matthew chapter 4 is fully about Jesus' humanness, Jesus' rawness. And this is what it says, then Jesus was led by what? Who? Everybody say that aloud. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil, verse 2, and after 
How many people like fasting? Raise your hand. We're going to be fasting in Lent, so get ready. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. I mean, verse 2 is the most obvious verse in the whole Bible. If you don't eat for 40 days, you're hungry. If you don't eat at all, you're <laughs> Me, I'm hungry all the time. But after fasting 40 days, the question no one asked about Jesus is, why did Jesus fast? You go, well, because he's Jesus. I mean, he's, you know, he likes to fast. You know, all the spiritual people like fasting and going home and, you know, they go to the monastery and just act holy and lift their hands up. And what, I mean, that, that's not me. You know, if you read this text and actually understood the framework of the New Testament, you would think that this is a little odd because Jesus' name and people called, you know, the, the peculiarness of Jesus in the New Testament is that he never fasted. Jesus actually never fasted in his life. This is the last fast he did. Well, I guess that's a lot of days. But people used to call Jesus a glutton. You drink, you eat, and you eat. When do you pray? And one of the, when the teachers of the law came to Jesus, you don't even wash your hand when you eat. You know, I mean, you're basically people called Jesus a, a pagan slob. All he did was party, they said. So if you look at this text and you go, why did Jesus fast? And you go, well, because he was guy. He wanted, you know, he was a contemplative. He, you know, he was a mystic. No, he wasn't. He was, I mean, really? They called him a glutton. He really loved to eat. Look at, look, read the New Testament again through the eyes of food. <laughs> it says that Jesus broke, I mean, sometimes I think when Jesus fed the 5,000 again, I was like, I think Jesus was just hungry. I mean, he went to Matthew's house. They brought food. He went to Mary's and Martha's house. Martha was so distracted making food because Martha knew Jesus liked to eat. And that's, that's why I say I'm very much like Jesus. I don't fast very much. You know, I, I, I don't. And, you know, the, tr the truth is no one likes to fast. Here, if you read the passage carefully in verse 1, it says that Jesus was led by the Spirit. And that's when you'll see me fast, when I'm led by God. Even though if he does, I will resist. But Jesus was led by the Spirit. It wasn't something he chose to do because he wanted to be holy. He fasted because he was led by the Spirit of God. Meaning you see now a introduction to the spirituality of Jesus, that Jesus is not just doing things of choices, but Jesus was influenced by God. You see, he was completely human being led by the Spirit or being led by the voice of God. I remember a couple of years ago on New Year's Eve, we had something called a prayer vigil where we prayed for three hours before New Year's was over. Some of the college students tell me today that it was the most excruciating experience of their life. They said that if we have that again, I will stop being a Christian. <laughs> they said uh, while they were praying for three hours as my wife was banging the piano and calling the sins out of people, calling the darkness out, rebuking the darkness. Oh, they said that, God, if you end this meeting, I will stop sinning for the rest of my life. <laughs> because if you read this text, if there's two greater evils, fasting is easier than prayer. But, I mean, seriously, no one wants to fast or even pray, but that's what Jesus was doing in the wilderness because he was led by the Spirit. He was led in conversation with God into a place. See, Jesus was not in a vacuum just praying, lying there and praying. Oh, I guess that's what Jesus' job is, to fast, not eat and pray. No. He was being led by the Spirit. And then you see the tempter come. We talked about this the week before and said, if you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. So now you see, in, in, you see a framework in Jesus' spirituality that Jesus is not just going into temptation or fasting out of his own will, but he's being led by God. He's close to God. Tell someone Jesus is really close to God. 
Jesus stayed near God. John 5, 19 says that Jesus says to the teachers of the law, he says that I do not do anything on my own. I only do what I see my father doing. And what a lot of people miss about the life of, Je a life of Jesus is that Jesus was very close to the presence of God in his life. And so you see that formation, that he had a second counterpart. And second, you see, Jesus answered, it is written. Now he's talking about the Torah. He's talking about, in a sense, the Old Testament. He's talking about the Bible, the first five books. It is written, man should not live on bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. But we saw right before verse 1 of Matthew 4 in chapter 3, Verse 17, it said that Jesus heard a voice come from heaven. And what did he say? This is what? My son, who I am well pleased. With whom I am well pleased. So you see here, and I want you to catch this word, you see a confluence, a convergence. And I, I want to use the word confluence, if you know what that means, is two streams of water coming together. Because sometimes in Christian spirituality, some people say, all you need is the Spirit. All you need is the Holy Spirit. He tells you stuff. He anoints you. He makes you fall on the floor. He makes you speak in tongues and prophetic and prophecy and intuitive and spiritual gift. All you need is that hot fire worship and all you need is the voice of God. That's what you need. But you see Jesus, you see the dualistic confluence the two streams of the spirit and the word in the spirituality of Jesus. You see Jesus being having a tension and a balance of those two things. He had an anchored life based on principle of the Bible and based on the narrative of God's people, but he had a balance between being led by God and hearing the heart of God and anchoring his life, what? In the word of God. Confluence, two streams. So you can hear people say, well, it, all you need is this, pray more, and you know, you're gonna grow. All you need is read the Bible more and you'll grow. Usually people never do the two. Because you need both. And why Jesus was able to live the life he lived was because he had that convergence, that two streams flowing together in his life. He had the word of God in his heart, and it was his anchor. But he knew the heart of the voice of God by the Spirit. How many people here, and I know that tons of people are adding to this list, we actually never saw in our church history people actually doing devotions. And this devotion is called Jesus Calling by Sarah Young. Christianity Today did an article on this book, let me just tell you, if you don't know Jesus Calling, download it, buy it, and get it. It is awesome. And many of you know. Actually, let me just tell you, 180 worship has changed as a result of many of you doing Jesus Calling. Because you don't know it, you just read it for three seconds or five, five, three minutes. Oh, cool. <laughs> and that's why you do it. It's so short. <laughs> God really made this. <laughs> it's so short you do it, and you're like, you don't think of it. But let me just tell you, is powerfully deceptive. Jesus' calling steers your direction if you do it in the morning. We actually hear the voice of God, and then you read the scriptures below, and you're just like, cool. And suddenly something happens in the soul. So, so, suddenly something happens in the heart. And, you know, Sarah Young is actually a very old woman in her 60s who's struggling with a rare disease. You know, went to one of the top liberal arts college in the country, became a missionary in Japan, and in, you know, France, learned to hear the, the voice of God. You know what she told her, you know, Francis Schaeffer, he's a contemplative that teaches on a spiritual formation. He, she told all the ladies in her group, I don't journal. I'm a hard-nosed liberal. I don't believe in, in, you know, in mysticism and spirituality. I believe in the word of God. I believe in, I'm a Calvin, I believe in, I'm a reformed Presbyterian. I don't do that kind of stuff. And the lady says, okay, but we're just saying, if you just sit down and journal a little bit and see and read the scriptures and see what Jesus is saying, he goes, Jesus is not speaking to me. 
So in the Alps, looking over the mountain, she got her pen grudgingly and started writing what Jesus started saying. She felt like. Okay? Tell someone felt like. Because if you come to me and said, Thus said the Lord, Pastor Sam, I'll go, get away from me. <laughs> she felt like it's an impression. It's an intuitive impression. It's visceral. This is a good visceral. The other week was bad visceral. Now, um, she felt God say, and she started writing these sayings of Jesus as she read scripture on her journal, which actually 30 years later became Jesus' calling. Let me just tell you by facts, Jesus' calling out, is outselling 50 shades of gray. They're both about intimacy. One is superficial. The other is deep. The one is the voice of God. The other is just external superficial fun called mommy porn. <laughs> But they're both about the same thing. But it tells you that it's selling a popular book like Fifty Shades of Grey because in the world, people are longing, longing for the presence of God. You, don't, you can't verbalize it. You don't want to say it. But people are longing to hear their maker, to know that they have a father that knows their name. There's a longing in the human spirit looking and longing for God. And it's outselling everything. The, the, and the problem is no one knows where she is. If you want to interview with Sarah Young, her publicist answers it for her because she's sick. She goes, I don't have time for that nonsense because she's an old lady now. She goes, I just write what Jesus says and that's it. It's not even me. That's why it's called Jesus Calling. I'm just the muse. I'm just the interpreter. So when you do Jesus Calling, you see the heart of God and the word of God come together in conversions. There's a confluence there. Two streams coming together, freely making a deep impact of growth. Folks, I just want to say this. Whether you're a Christian or not, whether you're investigating faith or not, the voice of God is speaking every day of our lives. Jesus is able to live the way he did as a full human being because he was led by God. He had the presence of God in his life, and so can we. And this is my absolute favorite verse, favorite quote from John Eldridge, Sacred Romance. Let me share that with you. And it's becoming deeper for me every year as I lose, as I lost both of my parents, as I had two deaths and two births of two of my sons, losing both of my parents, seeing ups and downs, seeing descents and essence. I read this again and again every year. And, and, and people, don't, don't look at it. Just listen to me. Focus on me. You're like, okay, what is that? Ooh, ooh. Squirrel, stop. Come back. Um, and it literally reminds me that the most powerful and provocative power in the world is the voice of God. And this is what John Oger says and Brent Curtis in The Sacred Romance. If we listen, a sacred romance calls to us through our hearts every moment of our lives. It whispers to us on the wind, invites us through the laughter of good friends, reaches out to us through the touch of someone we love. We've heard it in our favorite music, sensed it at the birth of our first child, been drawn to it while watching the simmer of a sunset on the ocean. The romance even is present in times of great personal suffering. The illness of a child, the lows, the loss of a marriage, the death of a friend, something cost to us through the experiences like these and rouses up an inconsolable longing deep within our heart. And that voice that calls to us is this place, no other than what? The voice of God. Folks, when I read this in college, I was like, that guy read my journal. As I read this now, after both my parents passing away in 24 months, Josh being 16 months, Nathan being almost seven in all the essence and the descents of my life in the last couple of years, I realized all through the darkness, all through the light, the voice of God was there. And you know what? If you think about it, in hindsight, the voice of God was in your life. To be led by God, to be led by God, it's just simply a desire to want to be close to God. 
And you know what? I think the church and Sarah Young proves that the urban church is longing for churches and communities to focus on how do I get close to God? I want to be close to God. Today, let me tell you why Jesus was an outlier. Simply because of this first lesson. Jesus was an outlier because Jesus, in his humanity, was completely what? Led by God. He was close to God. Nothing in his divinity, nothing to do with his, his nature of, of being God. He was a, a full human being that drew and stayed close to the presence of God. That's why he was transformed and changed. He became like God. Today, I pray that we would want the presence of God in our life. Because if you're broken, if you're lost, you're confused, you're, you know, in the grind of spirituality, and you know all the information, but you have no passion, you need God's presence to melt away all, the, all that stuff. And I pray the Spirit of God will show you today and give us that desire to be close to God. All God's people say? Amen. Amen. All right, let's move down. So, here... A, a lot of people miss this too, but um, Jesus had to be led by the Spirit to do this fast. Just think about it. Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil after how many days? Fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. I mean, I, I don't know. How's that even possible? How could you be hungry after 40 days? What about, what about the first day? What about the first five seconds? I'm, I'm dead serious here. No one could fast 40 days and 40 nights and not be hungry. I mean, for me, it might be three seconds. I give up usually. But God loves me. He knows my weakness. But, but it had to be supernatural. It had to be empowered by God, the Spirit. It, it's, it's not natural. You couldn't explain this naturally. Jesus was unable to do this before even defeating temptations and overcoming them. In a very brilliant way, Jesus was empowered by God to do this fast. I know someone that did a 40-day fast when he was 16. Let's look at this picture. If you, look, if you look all the way to your left, but this is when he was 13. Up there, I'm actually 19. I still look good no matter what. No, okay, I'm okay. Now, okay, go back to the point. So I heard a kid at 16 doing a fast for 40 days, and then this, is what, this is my first thought, and that's Peeps up there, Pastor Billy. So cute. I heard a kid was doing a 40-day fast, an attempt, and I thought to myself, that kid must be stupid. A lot of people are like, oh, man, he's so, so holy. I was like, did he look at himself in the mirror? I mean, I mean, okay, maybe if I do a fast, I know a couple other people that could use a 40-day fast just to lose weight. But this kid should not fast. He should first go to a doctor and say, hey, I'm going to fast for 40 days. That would be like, we're going to arrest you, put you in a clinical institution. You're too thin. I mean, he was thinner then. I mean, that's hard to believe. But I, I mean, I was just like, you know, first of all, that's my automatic thought. And then this kid must be really ambitious. But, you know, I'm joking. I mean, he was actually led by God to fast. And he, he confirmed a call to ministry there. And, you know, it, it was powerful for him. And he goes back to that, to, to that moment when God empowered him for the fast. Because that's really crazy. But I know pastors, there's stories of pastors, you know, spiritual ones, that fasted 40 days. And on the 40th day, they died. <laughs> Why are you laughing? It's horrible. <laughs> But I thought, stop. I thought about this and I said, when I heard the news, what, what? They died? What's the point? I would rather die eating. I mean, if you're going to die, 
You have nothing in your stuff. I mean, that's just, it's a tragedy. All right? So you can, do, you can do spiritual things not led by God and it be meaningless. Right? That's trying to conform yourself into the image of Jesus in, in spirituality rather than what? Being conformed. Peeps will go deeper into that in the next four weeks, but not, you know, not respectively. But he'll focus on that definition. You see, Jesus is empowered by the Spirit to do this work that was led by God. And that's why Jesus was able to do the things he did, he, he did in his life, in healing, in miracles, in loving those without mercy, defending the defenseless, because the Holy Spirit led him and empowered him to do those acts of love. A lot of people miss the empowerment piece of God the Spirit in their life. And people wonder, how come I can't live victoriously? How come I can't move to the next level? How come I'm not growing? How come I'm, I feel so stuck spiritually? Well, because Jesus himself was submitted to the Spirit and empowered by the Spirit and led by the Spirit to do, to overcome. So how much more then in our spirituality and in our faith do we need the empowerment of God's Spirit? Much more. That empowerment, that anointing, some people call it in some Pentecostal tradition, we call it in 180 the chills down your spine. That is what empowers Christians. God empowers us to do amazing things for his kingdom, to add value in this world. Going back to the Abrahamic covenant, to be, to be blessed, to be a blessing in the world, to be a shalom, to bring peace. So why was Jesus an outlier spiritually as he lived his life? We go back to his humanity. Second lesson we learn from this passage is simple. Jesus in his humanity was what? Completely what? Empowered by the Spirit. Empowered by God. So we can't use that excuse, well, Jesus was divine. Jesus was holy. Jesus was God. No, Jesus was a full human being, just submitted, completely submitted to the Spirit of God and anchored on the Word of God. You see those two streams, that confluence coming together, the integration, the convergence coming together, creating a new creation of a person that can add tremendous value in the world. That's what we want to develop this year. That's what we're going to focus on at the retreat. Trying to get those two streams of the Word and His Spirit together. You know, we haven't done a retreat for a long time. We're doing one because we feel what? The Spirit calling us to. Now I know, you know, some people, it's Valentine's Day. So come at night. Do your thing and then come at night or come Saturday morning. I don't care. Show up. I'm going to some type of orchestra early. What a bow tie. <coughs> you got to celebrate. Okay, that's good. But we're doing this retreat because the Spirit of God, really, we compelled as we prayed that we needed a retreat to help people this year develop these disciplines of grace so that we can have the Word of God anchor us, and we can have the Spirit of God empower us and lead us, so that we can really develop into what? Like Jesus. Because what? Spiritual transformation, as Mulholland says, is what? Being conformed to the image of Jesus for the sake of the world, for the sake of others. So today, I want to invite you with me to submit our full humanity to God. Use no more excuses. I'm not perfect. God is not asking for per perfection. He's asking for the right direction. Say, God, I want you to fill me. I want you to lead me. I want you to empower me. Let's all stand and pray together. Holy Spirit, I want to welcome the Spirit of God that empowered Jesus, that led Jesus, not only fast for 40 days and overcome the temptation in the desert, but it empowered him to love the defenseless, to love the widow, 
to feed the hungry, to heal the sick, to deliver demons from people tormented in their minds and heart. I want to pray for the spirit that empowered Jesus to die on the cross and submit his will to the heart of God so that humanity could be free and redeemed. I pray for the same spirit to lead us and empower us that we might strive to become like Jesus, that we might defend the widow, defend the defenseless, empower the weak, and we might love others with an everlasting love. this afternoon a new vision seeing the two streams in the life of Jesus we see the confluence we see that the Word of God anchored his life and the Spirit of God led his life and the Spirit of God spoke the heart and the voice of God that affirmed was firm by the Word of God father we want to become people that are empowered and led by God. Father, we fail to love people like we should because we're not empowered. We're not filled. How can a man do what he can't do without God? He can't. And that's why Jesus said, what is impossible with man is what? Possible. Everything is what? Possible with God. Paul says, you can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. That's what he means. A lot of people take that passage and go, if I just work hard enough. No. If you work hard in a ditch, you get a bigger hole. No, the strength is the spirit of God. 
So Holy Spirit, we want to pray today. Not in one shot, God. We don't want it simultaneously or instantaneously. We want it daily. We want a portion of your presence in our life to empower us and to lead us. So Lord, I want to pray as we leave this place that we would honor the voice of God in our life. And we would also honor the word of God. And those two streams would help us flourish in our relationship with God. Will you bow your heads for the benediction? May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. All God's people say, amen. amen. Go in peace and go in his presence. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Stu Still. I'm a small group leader here at 180 Church. How's everybody doing this Sunday? I guess not many people have tomorrow off and you're dreading going back to work, right? Well, again, my name is Stu Still. I'm a small group leader here. I want to welcome you all to our Sunday service. Before we get started, we have just a couple of quick announcements to go through, and we're going to start out with the Bible reading group. You know, um, a lot of people, when they when they think about, oh, I'm going to read the Bible, you know, they they look at it as like a history book or a boring textbook or something like that, but the Bible is so much more than that. It is really God's promise to his people and how God saves us. And a lot of the things that the early Christians and even the Jews before that went through are things that we go through today in our daily lives. And getting, getting a better basis in what God has done in their lives, you know, through the Bible can really help us out, can see, show us how we can, you know, make it through the world, how we can thrive in the world and really still be faithful to God and be blessed by God. So we want to invite everyone to join us at the Bible Reading Group. It's 180brg.tumblr.com. And you can get it subscribed to your smartphone, to your email. It's a great way to start your day, to get that little, little bite-sized piece of God's Word in your life to start your day with or to end your day with. Uh, so again, we just invite everyone to join us there to get that better uh, basis in God's Word. Our next announcement is about prayer texts and praises. We have our prayer line available. It's 5397 prayer, or you could send an email to prayer at 180church.tv. And we have this available so that in the times where we're going through things in our life, where we can't handle them on our own, where we don't know what to do, we can ask God for help because he is there. He is available for us to ask for that help. And when we send these prayer texts out, we have a team that prays for them as well so that we're not alone in the things that we're going through, but we have other people praying to God, interceding on our behalf you know, to God for the things that are going on. And a lot of people, if you ask around, you'll find people who have had God move powerfully in their lives through this prayer text line, through prayer. So um, again, we just invite everyone who's going through something in their life to send us a prayer text, send us a prayer email, ask God for some help, and he will come through. And when God does come through, you can send a praise request as well. That way we can all share in what God is doing in your life. Our next announcement is about tithes and offerings. And here as members at 180 Church, we believe that God is the center of everything that we have. He is the source of all that we have. And we honor that and we give back to God by tithing so that we can continue God's mission on earth. Uh, so that we can say to God, you know, God, you're the one that gave this to me and I want to give back just this portion because I am faithful to you the same way that you're faithful to me. So if you're a member here, we just want to remind you to continue to tithe faithfully. You can give on-site at the info booth in the back. You can give through Chase Quick Pay at our website, 180church.tv, or you can send us um, through PayPal, again, at our website at 180church.tv. Our next announcement is about sharing the gospel and we have different ways that we can share the gospel and really get in touch with the gospel and communicate you know as a community together not just here in new york but around the world through our facebook through pastor sam's twitter page and we can always watch the uh, sermons through youtube so we just invite everyone you know take a few seconds you know during the week like the facebook uh, page like the uh, sermon share it on your facebook wall share it with your twitter friends there are a lot of people who've had god really move powerfully in their lives through sharing the gospel in this way. So we just, again, invite everyone to share the gospel. Uh, our next announcement is about small groups, and small groups are where we get together to go deeper into the Word, to see where God is really forming us, where he's trying to help us develop spiritually in him. And we get together as a smaller group so that we can talk about the things that are going on in our lives and the, the ways that God is forming us. And we can draw strength from other people who have gone through the same things and God has moved in their lives. So if you're not in a small group, um, or even if you're uh, a new person here, if you're still trying to figure out where Jesus Christ fits in your life, this is a great place to ask those questions, you know, to really get the answers from the people who God has moved in their lives. So we just invite you to join a small group. You can talk with Andrew Park. He'll get you plugged into one. 
Our next announcement is about the uh, retreat. It's going to be coming up President's Day weekend, February 14th through 17th. It's going to be a lot of fun. We're just inviting everyone to keep that weekend blocked out. You know, don't make any plans for anything. I know it's kind of during the Olympics. I just had to tell some friends of mine I can't go watch the uh, the U.S. versus Russian hockey game, which is a real bummer. But you know what? 180 retreat, a lot better than a hockey game. So um, again. Make, make plans to keep that weekend clear so that you can join us. We'll give you all the information as time comes along. And uh, now is a good time if you're a driver, start thinking about who you can take with you because we're going to need uh, people to help drive us people around. So um, start thinking about that. And again, we'll give you all the information uh, that we can as it comes available, but keep that weekend free because it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, I think that's all of our announcements. As always, you can find these announcements and everything else uh, on our website at 180church.tv.